Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Shamanism. We're going to be talking about that today as we have a special guest who is the first white person to be fully initiated into the tradition of being the healer in the Zaus lineage of South Africa after having spent 10 years in apprenticeship with the tribe that gave us Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu. We're going to discover the essence of this shamanic teaching and the techniques of prayer, dream work, and connection to nature to help people connect with their own ancestors and spiritual traditions. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, African shaman John Lockley. John, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Tell us how this all started for you. Um, well, just um, just a quick little little correction there for you is that I'm not uh, I'm not the first white guy. I'm one of the first. So you could say I'm one of the first um, uh, post apartheid South Africa. Although there have been documented cases of of other white guys in the past. Um, well, in any case, it's a pretty unique uh, uh, specialty that you that you have going on here. It sounds like. <laughs> yes, yes, it is, a, it is a speciality which I. I kind of born with yes. <laughs> yes, there you go. So tell us how this all started for you. What, what was your interest that drew you in this direction? Okay, well, firstly, I can say that uh, in this in this tradition or the tradition of of, of the Sangoma culture in southern Africa, you get called to become a Sangoma. So it's uh, it's the tradition of of old shamanism, old traditional shamanism, and um, it's quite similar all the way around the world in, in my studies. So um, in the studies that I've made. Since since I received my calling dreams, um, so with me I started get, receiving dreams. It's a long story, so I don't want to bore the listeners too much. But basically, I started with dreams at the age of seventeen, where I was being called to yeah to train, you know, to train to become a sangoma. So, um, but it actually started my journey started before I was born. It started with my my mother in Dublin in Ireland, and she had dreams about elephants. And um, those dreams spurred her on to going to Africa, where she met my father. And, um, and then they went into the South African bush to actually work with and, and, um, and see elephants, African elephants. So when I finished my training um, in 2007, my mother had a number of dreams where she was taken into the bush, the African bush. And these elephants came and surrounded her. And she wasn't sure what it all meant. So she woke up after the first dream, and she said to me, you know, what do the dreams mean? You know, all these elephants surrounding me. And uh, she was scared. She ran up this tree. <laughs> so I said to her, next time you have the dream, Mom, come down from the tree and don't be afraid and just see what the elephants have to say. So the next night she had the same dream. She climbed up the tree. She was afraid of all the elephants. It was a very, very vivid dream. And, um, and anyway, she came down from the tree, tree, just like I said to her, and she said all the elephants raised their trunks. And I said to her, she, and then she woke up, and, uh, and I said to her, the elephant people are honoring you. They saying thank you, because the Sangoma people are known as the elephant people. They are the medicine people of Southern Africa. So she risked a lot and sacrificed a lot in leaving her family in Ireland to come all the way to Africa in order for me to um, to be born and have this calling, because the old ways are dying out in, in Ireland. The old psychic ways are working with dreams and, and plants. So when I was born, I was born with a white clay around my eyes, and uh, I was born in Cape Town, just below Table Mountain. And as I came out with the white clay, this kind of white-looking birth skin around my eyes, my mother said to the doctor that I looked like a little, a little Aborigine. <laughs> and he was, he was really shocked because there was apartheid South Africa then. <clears throat> and he was this uh, beautiful white doctor. And, um, and people just didn't speak like that. So, um, so she said, uh, he looks like a little Abbo, <laughs> you know, with my white clay on my eyes. And, uh, and then when my, my teacher met my mother, um, years later, in 2005 or 2004, um, my, te- my mom said uh, she remembered my birth when she saw my teacher because my teacher also has that white clay around her eyes. So she spoke to her and uh, she said the way I was born with this clay. And my teacher said, yes, that's correct because um, all Sangormas are born. You know, all, we will, you know, she said I was, I was born to become a Sangorma and that she was born like that as well. So 
um, <clears throat> for me, I mean, I, I had these calling dreams when I was 17. And in the beginning of the dreams, it was, it was encouraging me to, to find gold, to find inner gold. So I remember walking through the jungles of South America in that original dream. And I was searching for gold. And as I woke up from the dream, I found the gold in South America. And there was this woman's voice that said to me, in order for me to, in order for me to find my destiny, I have to come close to death. Now, finding your gold was clear for me when I woke up that finding the gold was actually finding my destiny, finding my calling in this life. And she just said to me very quietly, in order for you to find that, you need to come close to death. Now, at that stage, it was the, it was the South African, um, there was a war in South Africa, there was a civil war, and there was also a very serious ongoing war in Angola, which had been going on for about 10 years. It was basically the equivalent of our Vietnam in S- Southern Africa. And um, a lot of white boys were conscripted into the army to serve for about two years. And uh, I knew that my time was coming when I was going to be conscripted. So I chose to go into the medical corps in order for me to learn to become a, a paramedic and also to go to the front lines, possibly Angola. And my plan there was um, just to help, you know, to be of service in some way. So what happened was the South African, uh, the war ended, um, the Angolan war in, in South Africa ended um, at the end of 1989, and in December, and then I was conscripted into the army in January. So I didn't have to go to the front lines. So my first, my first assignment really was working in one military hospital and um, helping to rehabilitate soldiers, special forces soldiers from the front lines. And um, interesting enough, that's where Nelson Mandela actually died, was actually in one military hospital. So... My first assignment was working with these special forces soldiers, and um, they were some of the most hardened and most highly trained soldiers in the world at that time. And one of the first things I noticed about them was that they were very calm and they were very dignified. And now in those days, like I say, it was apartheid, so we had different wards and they were segregated. So we had the white ward and then we had the guys in the, who were black in another ward. But it was all part of the same ward, so it was just different rooms. And I was pleased to see that they were all given the same level of medical care. You know, the food, medical care, it was all of a high, high, high level. And um, so I was very pleased to notice that. So my job was to just make sure that everyone was happy and and that they had everything they needed, you know, um, as part of the support staff for the nursing nursing support staff. And um, every day I used to go into the ward and I used to say to the special forces guys, good morning, guys, did you have any good dreams? And um, they all kept quiet, Uh, opened the curtains, the sunshine would come flooding in, and there was this quietness like a church. And then the second day I walked in and I said, good morning, guys, did you have any good dreams? And again there was this silence. Now I was asking that question because of my own background of dreaming, coming from my mom and coming from my Irish family, which is very normal to talk about dreams. So anyway, the third day I walked into the ward and, uh, and this ward was, like I said, the Special Forces guys and they were all black soldiers, this particular room. And um, I opened the curtains and I said, good morning guys, did you have any good dreams? And um, there was again the silence and suddenly at the back of the room there was this voice coming from a man who was a sergeant, Sergeant Maruleki, a Zulu, a Zulu special forces sergeant with a lot of authority. And he said to me, Private, come over here. I want to speak to you. So I walked over to his bedside and I said, Yes, Sergeant, sir. How can I help you? And he said, Private. I said, Yes, sir. He said, In my culture, dreams are very sacred. He said, When I dream, my ancestors tell me who's going to live and who's going to die in my platoon. I tell my men, this is their time, their ancestors are calling them, and they still die. Um, Some of them laugh at me, sorry, some of them laugh at me, 
but they still die. So he said to me, in my culture, dreams are very sacred. Please don't ask me if I've had any good dreams again. And I said to him, yes, yes, sir, yes, sergeant. Because um, he was actually becoming a, a Sangoma in the Zulu lineage in South Africa. <clears throat> and um, he was uh, being given gifts by the nursing staff every day. And so he was, he was, it was, that was my first Sangoma teaching. And um, then what happened to me was I started my own Sangoma calling, the calling dreams, about three months later. And what precipitated that was I asked the matron of the hospital if she could put me um, into one of the intensive care units so that I could really work with people who are dying because these soldiers were not dying. They were, you know, we were rehabilitating them and helping them get over post-traumatic stress and that kind of thing. So the intensive care unit was full, so I was put into the neurology unit, which was also a very intensive nursing unit. And within the first few days of going into the unit, one of my um, patients died, and we put him into a body bag, which was quite traumatic for me, actually. It was the first time I'd ever experienced that. And then I nursed a young man for six weeks until he died, and I felt his pulse going underneath my fingers and and every day his mom would ask me if he was going to live or die and and um, I said he was going to live but his body was in a very bad state and eventually the nursing staff and the and the family decided to turn off the machines that were keeping him alive and then I was put on the the death watch to observe his body and his vital signs and to alert the family so that's what I did and um, as I left his his room for the last time, and I was going on leave for a few days, I asked the ancestors. Well, those days, in those days, I didn't talk about ancestors, so I just spoke to God and I prayed, and I asked that I could learn something, another way of of teaching, another way of medicine, so that if ever in the situation again, I'd be able to talk to the mother, and give a message from the soul of the of the of the client of the patient and give it to the family because we had the best medicine in the world we couldn't do anything for the suffering of this family we couldn't do anything for the suffering of this young man who was dying so i wanted to learn another form of medicine that could connect to the soul of man so i was praying like this earnestly as i was watching my my patient die and uh, and then i was very angry because i just said to god you know this suffering is wrong this is wrong you know so I left his room, and um, and then when I came back a few days a few days later, his room was empty, and he had passed on. He had died. So I went through a very strong healing crisis then, and um, I actually started learning Zen meditation and um, and learning how to meditate and calm my mind. And I was attracted to Buddhism because it's, it says life is suffering. So that's what attracted me to it: birth and death, the circle of life. And life is suffering. So I practiced Buddhism and Zen very earnestly, you know, just like a soldier. And um, I went to my first retreat while I was still in the army. And um, it was about a four-day retreat. It was a silent retreat. And at the end of the retreat, I had this dream where I was contacted by a a Sangoma. In those days, I called him a witch doctor because I didn't know the Sangoma culture at all. It was still apartheid South Africa, and it was still segregated, so I couldn't go, I couldn't go in and find a Sangoma to, to train me. So in the dream, I saw this, uh, this man I called a witch doctor, and he was speaking to me, and he showed me a vision of the future, five years into the future, all of which happened. And I asked him to train me. I said, please train me. Please show me about nature, about life, about suffering. And he kept quiet. He didn't say a word to me, and I asked him three times. And then eventually he showed me the vision of the future, like I say, five years into the future, which all came to, all came to, you know, all came to uh, fruition. And he said, started speaking to me, and he said, in order for me to teach you these old, ancient ways, he says, you're going to suffer like you've never suffered before, and you're going to come close to death. You're going to get very, very sick, because he said, that's the way it is in our culture you're going to get an illness and you're going to get very sick. 
And he said, I, really, I said to him, I really am sick because I've had to nurse patients to, you know, to the other side. And I've, I've observed a lot of suffering in South Africa because of apartheid and being in a, in a civil war. And I've also had to put my beloved dog down recently. And I'm only 18. I said, I'm only 18 years old, I said to him. <clears throat> so he said, okay. And then when I woke up that morning, I had all these boils over my legs and, uh, and I was very sick. And I was happy. Um, I was happy because I realized that he had accepted my, my calling. Can you hear me there? Hello? Yes, we're still here. Okay. So, um, yeah, so like I say, I was happy that he had accepted, accepted me to be his student, even though this was all dreams. But uh, physically, I was getting very sick. So I went to the hospital because I was on duty. And, uh, and I'd contracted tick bite fever, which I think you guys call Lyme disease. Mm-hmm. And uh, because I'd been in a forest and I'd been bitten by all these ticks, which is strange because no one else I was with um, was bitten by any ticks. So I think they might have had one tick bite one, between all of them, but no one got sick like me. And um, and then from then on, I got one illness after the next, one physical illness. You know, I got dysentery, I got bilharzia, I got hepatitis. So I got all kinds of physical illnesses, and my body was deteriorating. I was getting very, very skinny. I was losing energy. And then on the other side, I was getting all these psychic dreams where I saw the future. I looked at someone. I could tell what was happening with them. I was having all these dreams of spirits and going into other worlds and other dimensions. So it was a very, very powerful time. But um, unfortunately for me, it was still apartheid South Africa, so I couldn't just go wandering into a, a township or rural area and find a teacher so my dreams led me to continue with my zen training and uh, and i went to south korea and i trained in south korea with one of my zen masters then zen master subong and i did a kyoche which is a silent zen retreat for three months and at the end of the retreat they asked me to become a, a zen monk and to join them in south korea and um nelson mandela had been released then and he was about to go for the for for president in south africa so I felt that my calling was actually to become an African monk, um, a, a Sangoma. So I said, no, I need to go back to South Africa. So I left South Korea, went back to South Africa, voted for Nelson Mandela. <laughs> and, um, and then I went back to university. And in my final year at university, that's when I met my teacher, my Sangoma teacher, my Kosa teacher, because I actually live in an area where Nelson Mandela was raised and brought up and it's a closer area of South Africa, the closer nation, and it's a, it's a rural area. So my teacher comes from, like I say, the closer nation, and what happened in terms of me meeting her was very, very, was very auspicious and very beautiful. So what actually happened was that she had a dream the night before I met her where she said, Utiko, which is the Great Spirit. She said the Great Spirit came to her and said to her that she must prepare herself to train someone from another culture to become a senior Sangoma like herself. She must ready herself for this. And then the next day I came through the gate with my girlfriend and my interpreter, and she said I was the man that she had to train. And she went down and she gave the divination, and the divination is reading the soul of someone. And in a closer way, you, you, you basically just start channeling. You just start talking, and f- you just feel the energy and the soul of the client, and you just speak to that. So she, she just started speaking, and she was so accurate, it was incredible. She spoke about the last seven years of my life and how sick I got, and she spoke about my dreams and my calling, and it was absolutely unbelievable. I'd never experienced anything like that in my life because I'd never met her before. She didn't know me. I came from another culture. She didn't even speak English, you know? So then she looked at me, and she said to me, what took you so long to come here? And I said to her, apartheid. And she said, oh. Uh, she said, oh, God, oh, God, I'm so sorry. We almost lost you. And then a tear went rolling down her face. And um, she said to me, do you want to become a Sangoma, a traditional healer, mm-hmm. and a shaman, you know? Well, she wouldn't say shaman because we don't have that word in South Africa, but basically it's a traditional shaman. And I said to her, what does it mean to become a Sangoma? And she said, to become a Sangoma means you're going to be able to heal people in all different ways. And also you're going to be able to, you're going to stop being so sick. You're going to put on weight and you're going to not be so sick anymore. So 
I said to her, yes, that sounds good. Sounds like a good deal. So she said to me, okay, well, you come back um, tomorrow and I'll give you your first white beads to say that uh, as a mark of you taking on this apprenticeship and being my, my student. So I said, wonderful. So I went home that night um, with my girlfriend and we, had, um, we were running a, a Zen center there, a Buddhist center. And um, the next day in the morning, we found a neatly folded up white goatskin placed just near the entrance to the meditation center. And we've got lots of dogs in the area, and it's pretty wild. And not one of the dogs touched the goatskin, not one of them. It was very, very mysterious. So I took the goatskin all the way up to her, and I said, this is what we found in the morning. And I said, did you bring this? She said, no, I had nothing to do with this. And she, she was quiet for a moment, and she closed her eyes, and she said, Izinyanya ziavumile. She said, the ancestors have agreed to train you. You're going to be trained in the old ways. And I said, um, um, she said, this is a sign that you're going to be trained in the old ways. And then she didn't bring the goatskin, but someone else must have done that. And the ancestors are working to train me in the old ways. And then I got really afraid. I just felt this energy going through me, and I said, okay. And I said, I will train on one condition. She says, what is that condition? I said, I'll train um, on one condition that you train me as if I'm a closer man. Do not, do not make things easy for me or, or, or um, cut out any steps because I'm a white man. I said, you train me as if I'm closer. And she said to me, of course. That's the only way to train you, is if you're closer. And you're going to be adopted into my family. You're going to become one of my sons, my, one of my adopted sons. And that's what happened. So oh. I learned the language. I was already learning the language at university. And, um, and then I trained with her for 10 years. So it's a long story. I've tried to shorten it. But, but basically, well, in a it's nutshell... It's very necessary that people understand the process. This isn't something you just decide one day... No. I'd like to become a Sagoma. It's, it's, no. It reminds me, there was a gentleman that I had talked with around uh, 2000, I believe it was, and he was actually initiated through a series of dreams into Central America and was initiated to become a ceremonial flute player while at the same time also being indoctrinated into uh, uh, their form of medicine through the Mayan culture. And it was really fascinating to hear the story because, you know, the, the idea that you're drawn to something. It isn't something you think one day, oh, that seems like that would be a cool thing to do. You're drawn to it. That You're being brought to this, you know, here. And, and that's quite a responsibility. Yes, and it's still a responsibility for me because it's a big job in being, a, you know, a lineage holder now because I'm, I'm the first of my teacher's apprentices to finish the training mm -hmm. so it's, it's it is quite a responsibility but it's it's obviously also exquisitely beautiful and now i, I feel a, a f the second calling i had was to bring this message into the western world mm -hmm. and uh, and the way that happened for me because people always wonder what is a white man bringing this message out into into the world and um, people get very very stuck on the color of my skin and, uh, and I find it very, very sad, actually, because South Africa, we, we, we went through this terrible war, the civil war, to do with color of skin. And we came out with a great sense of love and understanding. And I always say to people, do you think it's okay for a black person in South Africa or anywhere in the world to become a, an English priest, an Anglican priest, a Methodist priest? And everyone, of course, will say yes. And I'll say, well, do you know Archbishop, Arch, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He's a closer man, but he's also an Anglican priest, an archbishop, an English priest. So it's obviously okay for him to become an English priest. Why is it a problem for a white man to become a closer priest? You know, why is that a problem? If you demonstrate the calling and you do all the steps that are required like I have done. So... This is a problem that I've found not just in South Africa, but worldwide, this kind of reverse racism, which is very, very sad, and it can actually affect the, the, the Westerner or the European or the white person because 
is basically saying, I can follow an indigenous healer, but I can't go where they've gone because I'm white. Wow. And that can affect the growth of so many people you cannot imagine. Because to say to yourself and look in the mirror, I'm a white guy, so I cannot connect with the indigenous soul of man, is a <laughs> huge, huge, huge problem which basically brings up a whole lot of other things. Because if you put indigenous people on a pedestal and you say they are you say they are better than you in some way, yeah. then you're going to knock them down somewhere else, and there's going to be huge prejudice coming up, coming up somewhere else, you know? So, um, so I think uh, it's very, very important for people to really look at their own prejudices and also realize that in terms of the spirit world, people can become shamans no matter what color of skin you have. It all depends on how you're being called in your dreams, right. how are your spirits calling you, how are your ancestors calling you, what are your dreams saying, this is very clear, and this is very important, mm -hmm. and this is part of my message, and um, how this message came to me, as I was saying to a friend yesterday, um, uh, it was around 2003, and I was doing a ceremony in South Africa, and it was a very powerful ceremony, we were all dancing outside, all the Sangomas were dancing, and they were dancing around me in a circle, and then they would change direction. So it was creating this incredible kind of vortex energy, and I was dancing as well, and it was an amazing feeling. It was very, very beautiful. And I was taken in trance to a very far-off place, to the land of my ancestors. And the spirits were talking to me, my ancestors were speaking to me, and they were saying to me, one day, John, we are going to call you to your blood people. And we are going to uh, call you to your blood people and encourage you to show them how they can find their way home. And we want you right now to show the Posa people the utmost respect and learn everything you can from them and be ready so that one day when we call you, you can come and teach your blood people how they can find their way home. Mm -hmm. And then the vision stopped and my Sangoma friends stopped dancing. And then a man who we say is a prophet who makes beautiful drums, he came running towards me. He grabbed my hands and the tears were flowing down his face. And he said to me, ah, so what he's saying is, my whole life, I didn't think that the white people had spirit. Mm. But today, I see in you that you do have spirit, that white people do have the spirit. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for that. I thank God for opening my heart and showing me that white people too have spirit. And I thank you, Tlingo Lindaba. I thank you, John Lockley. I thank you. And the tears are rolling down his face. And the tears are rolling onto my hands. So it was a very powerful moment because he didn't see my vision, but he felt it. He felt the vision that I had. He felt it, but he didn't know what it was. But he felt the spirit coming into me he felt the spirit of, of Utiko, of the great spirit. He felt that. So many people, again, ask me, why are you coming to America? Why are you coming to Europe? And the question and the answer is always the same. I'm coming to show you how you can find your way home. I'm coming to show you how you can connect with your ancestors, your blood, and your dreams. I'm coming to show you how you can connect with your indigenous soul. And I do not care what color your skin is. I do not care what language you speak. I don't care what you look like. But if you want to learn how to connect with your dreams and your ancestors, I can do that. But do not judge me by the color of my skin. For I am the white leopard. Mm -hmm. The white leopard from Africa. That's what I am. So those are my teachings in a very clear and in a nutshell, and it's about honoring the soul of man, 
Mm-hmm. It's called Ubuntu Ubunzulu, which means the depth of humanity. And these teachings are the same teachings that Nelson Mandela was reared on. He was brought up in a traditional Kosa way, and he was brought up knowing Ubuntu Ubunzulu, the depth of humanity, which means you cut my arm, red blood flows. I cut your arm, red blood flows. Abantu Bafana. People everywhere are the same. And that is why he became a world leader and an icon of humanity. Mm-hmm. And it's the same for Desmond Tutu. They both read on the concept and idea of Ubuntu, which means humanity. What does it mean to become a human being? It means I cut your arm, red blood flows. I cut my arm, red blood flows. When I dream, I go to another space. And when I sleep, I dream. When you sleep, you dream. We are all the same. So that's why these two men became, have become iconic humanitarians, iconic figures on the world stage. But these teachings, um, they don't talk about these teachings directly. I'm teaching these teachings directly because, because I'm trained as a Sangoma, as a medicine man. So um, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to share some of this. <laughs> Absolutely. We love that our listeners can connect with any way that will actually help guide them on their soul's journey. It seems to be one of those areas that can become very confusing and, you know, the opportunity to be able to to know how to go about doing that is something that's really needed, especially this day and age where we seem to be somewhat lost because we're surrendering our personal power to so-called experts that think they know more about our lives than we do, you know, and to be able to vibrate back into that connection and to be in truth, to be in spirit is very important. And I know that you're on a U.S. tour now, yes. and I understand that you will be in Portland, Oregon, it uh, looks like November 4th through the 7th? Yes, that's correct, yes. Okay. And uh, people can always look at my website, which is um, just uh, johnlockley.com, and I have the events of Portland clearly demarcated under the calendar section. So um, if people want to connect with their dreams, if they want to connect with their ancestors, then I'm the man who can help them. I think um, an interesting one, too, if you can, uh, people can make their way out to Colorado, would be on Halloween, dancing with our ancestors. Yes. <laughs> that, that seems like a, 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 an interesting way to spend Halloween, I would think. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way. But let me say another third thing, which is connected to your blood and your ancestors and your dreams, and that is life calling. I always talk to people about how you can find your life calling or your life path calling. And, um, and I always say to people, it's very, very simple. And uh, I, always, I always mention my teachings as being like African Zen <laughs> because it's, it's very, very simple, but you have to do it. Right. So in a few minutes, I can explain this to you. If people want to know how to connect with their dreams, ancestors, and life calling, I can explain to the listener in about three minutes. Okay, well then we'll give you the three minutes there. (laughs) Okay. Now the first thing for for the person to do is you can light a stick of incense because a bit of smoke is nice, and a white candle. And this is just to help focus your mind. You don't need it. You can even do it outside. You can do it without anything. But to focus your prayers, it's nice to have a bit of smoke and, and a candle. The next thing to do is to stand firmly, feel your feet on the ground, and stomp your feet into the ground a few times, just to feel that nice earth connection in the base of your, fo- of your feet. And then you look upwards, and you just say your name clearly. You voice your name. You speak your name out. You will say, my name is... You will say your full name and you will include your mother's maiden name because you are a child of two lineages, your mother's side and your father's side. So you'll just say, my name is... Like for me, I would say, my name is John Keith Kelly Lockley. My mom is a Kelly, my dad's a Lockley. And then the next thing you do, you have a sense in your heart of turning to the left. Sorry, sorry, not... The first thing you do is you look upwards and you... Honor and praise the great spirit, the great dreamer, the great mystery. You say utiko. So you look upwards and you honor and praise the great spirit. And then you have a sense of turning to your left and you honor and praise your mother's people and you say her name. And then turn to the right 
and have a sense of honoring and praising your Father and His people and say the name. And then the next thing, talk to your ancestors, talk to your DNA, honor and praise your people. We say, Abba Zalibam, your parents. So you'd mention all the ancestors or surnames in your family down your father's side and mother's side. And you would just say, I am your child and I call on you. Come and be with me. Show me how I can realize my destiny in this world and the next. I call on the Great Spirit. I call on my mothers and fathers of old. I thank you, Ndiabolela. I thank you for the gift of life. Ndiangola Ndiatandaza. I honor and praise you, and I thank you for the gift of life. And I ask you, mothers and fathers, to please come into me. Come into my life and show me how I can realize my destiny in this world and the next. Show me how I can be in service to myself and my community and the world in this world and the next. So those are the prayers. Because for us, you have to accept your calling. To accept your calling means to accept your life. To accept your life means basically to give thanks for the gift of life. So the reason why you're honoring and praising your parents is because you need to honor and give thanks for the gift of life which your parents have given you. Now, where a lot of Westerners get hung up around this is when it comes to trauma and psychological and physical abuse, which is in families everywhere. So I always say to them, you still honor and praise your parents no matter what, but you never honor and praise bad behavior. When you're honoring and praising your parents, you're honoring and praising the consciousness which they've given you. You're honoring and praising the shining that they've given you. And um, in Buddhism, we call that Buddha nature. And we say the Buddha nature, everything has Buddha nature, everything has the shining. So you are honoring and praising that shining consciousness which your mother and father have passed on to you. And if there is abuse in the family and difficulties, you call on the ancestors down both sides of the family to bear witness to this. And, ask, and you ask for strength so that you can bring back the dignity in the family. Mm-hmm. So... The rule of thumb here is there's no way around it. You're born into a particular family in order for you to stand tall with your dignity and connect with the earth and connect with your indigenous soul, which is going to bring you the dreams of your calling. In order for you to do that, you need to accept your life and you need to give thanks for your life. And the way you do that is you say your name, in a, in a, just in a very prosaic, a very practical way, you just say your name out to the universe and you honor and praise your mother and father. And if there is abuse, you call on your ancestors to help you get strong and deal with that because it's no good if you have a picture of the Dalai Lama in your house and you honor him, but you do not honor and praise your mother and father. It is no good. It's mm. no good, you know? Interesting. It's it no good at all. It sense, too. Because if you have a picture of the Dalai Lama and you're honoring and praising him, but you have, no, and that you have no respect or feeling for your mother and father, that is not a spiritual person. That is not the way to go. Because you are, have come into this life through your mother and father. You need to see them as the, the, the you know, you need to honor and praise them, give thanks to them for this gift of life. And in so doing, you can honor the Dalai Lama. Does it make sense to you when I say this? It absolutely does, because I was just thinking, uh, as you were sharing your story earlier about being directly connected with spirit or soul, Yes, is that a lot of times people will go out there and they'll spend their Sundays or whatever day they choose to go to their religious practice, so to speak. Mm. But yet, in a seemingly hypocritical way, They'll turn around and do all the things they were praising against. <laughs> it's like, yes. what kind of truth is that soul there? You're not even living in the soul because the soul is truth. It's what it is. You know, you can't deny that no matter how much you try to cover it up. But there it is, you know. And so it makes a lot of sense to say, yeah, sure, go ahead and pray to this, but then don't honor your own parents. It doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't. And I think that's where this, this, this harmony comes in, in, into the world, and that's where this lack of truth and lack of love comes. So um, almost if there is trauma in the family and abuse in the family, that challenge and that wound is where your work is. Because 
where your work is, is where there's a wound. And there's a wound, and once you've got this wound, it means you need to heal it. You need to focus on it. And in so doing, you become the wounded healer. As you heal that wound, then you have a certain amount of authority to heal others with that particular wound. So the particular wound that I've got is this wound of apartheid, where white people are good at this, black people are good at that, white people can only do certain things, black people can only do other things. That's a particular wound that I've been brought up in because of the civil war in South Africa, where um, black people can do indigenous stuff and they can connect with ancestors and they can connect with plants, and white people can, can become doctors and lawyers and psychologists. So I've bridged that, and my closer name is Utringolindaba, which means the bridge, the communicator, the messenger, the bridge between two cultures, between different cultures. That's my name and Kosa. So what I'm saying is that it doesn't matter who you are, what culture you are, what language you speak, man or woman, you can connect with the indigenous soul inside of you no matter what. But you have to do the work. So I've right. done the work, and my job with clients and people in workshops is to teach them how to do the work themselves. I can't do the work for them. I'm a wounded healer. I've gone through this pain and this process, and my job is to show people how they can do it themselves. Now, I have a little disclaimer for the listeners, and that is that this work is difficult because this work is about discovering your wounds and healing it. Mm -hmm. So this work is about feeling your suffering, not putting it under a carpet, not going love and light and taking some kind of pill or, or drug or something to make you smile and make you get blissed out. This is about feeling your suffering, feeling your issues, but not dramatizing it. Just feeling it in your bones and your blood and breathing it out. Feeling it, breathing it out, and praying. Praying for strength. That's what this work is about. And then you become the wounded healer, and then you are able to heal people in all different ways. So that's what I'm teaching. And um, it is difficult, but it's also the most incredibly beautiful and sublime practice that I've ever encountered. So that's why I teach it. Um, mm -hmm. And I always say to the listeners and the people, like I said to you just now, before you start the practice, stamp your feet into the ground. Feel your heels penetrating the earth. Feel your heart and your chest being open. Take a deep breath in. Open your arms and say your name to the universe. Say it with dignity. Say it with pride. Because your life is sacred. Every person's life, every life is sacred. And you need to say your name out with dignity and with beauty, with authority, and feel, ah, I'm alive. And thank God and my ancestors for this. Well, I'm certain that our listeners are going to take a lot away from this today, but as you said, it's about stepping in the direction of a path that can be very difficult. And you're right, it is to realize those wounds you have that perhaps you haven't faced may be in there still. And you need to bring those out. You need to honor, the, of course, how you feel and, and, and allow these things to go and then use that which you have learned, as you were saying, to be able to help others to do the same thing. Yes, and so that's what happens. It's like a, a domino effect. The teacher is like the bee, so I'm like the bee, and I'm pollinating the flowers. So the clients are like flowers. I pollinate the flowers, <laughs> and then, then the, the flowers can turn into bees themselves and help pollinate and help others. Mm -hmm. So the only process there is about really feeling your DNA, feeling your heartbeat feeling the pulse of blood going through your veins, breathing in, saying your name, looking to your mom and dad and giving thanks, real thanks in your heart for the gift of life they've given you and feeling the struggles of your ancestors. You know, if, if I just start looking at my own ancestry just a little bit, and I'm sure a lot of listeners can, can probably feel this as well in their own lives, I think of my mom coming from Ireland and I think of my Irish relatives and, and what Ireland went through in terms of the famine. You know, over 6 million, over 7 million Irish people died from starvation. And that wasn't that long ago. I'm sure a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of American people who, who come from Ireland remember these stories. 
Now, my ancestors survived the famine. They survived that, that process of starvation, which was incredibly traumatic and incredibly painful. They survived that, but they had their wounds. And for me, as a healer, as a, as a shaman, as a sangoma, I need to also feel the wounds of my ancestors. So as I've gone on pilgrimage and lived in Ireland, I have felt that, and that that helps me, you know, helps me to appreciate my ancestors and love them and also give thanks for the beauty and sacredness of, of this human life. You know, if you think about what your ancestors have gone through, even here in America, you know, the, the grief and the pain and the struggle that they've gone through in order for us to be sitting here with our cell phones and our phones. And, you know, it's only really the last 50 years that we've actually really felt in the Western world this luxury of cell phones and everything else. Mm -hmm. But before that, not long ago, our ancestors and our parents and our grand grandparents and great-grandparents, they, they had a tough time. They had a tough time, you know, and it was a lot of heartache, you know. And now the heartache nowadays has changed slightly in the Western world. People are suffering from depression. Depression is the fastest growing illness in the Western world. Now, in the Kosen Zulu languages in South Africa, there's no word for depression. There's only umoya panzi, okanya umoya pezulu, which means spirit energy down, which is depression, or spirit energy up. Now, the job of the Sangoma is to help individuals and community to lift their spiritual energy up, to lift it upwards. So I see that's part of my job is for people to, to really look at their sadness and their suffering and to not put it under the, the carpet, um, to not look for some distraction, but to just feel their breath inside of them, feel their heart, feel their pain, and they do something to change that energy and that habit, that pain, that suffering. So that's where the prayers come in. That's where the dancing comes in. That's where the songs come in. So I'm really speaking to that. I'm speaking to that soul disharmony, that soul sickness. How can you heal your soul? And every person can heal it themselves. They just need to know how to do it. And they need to push their feet into the ground and just feel, feel their pain and pray. Call for help and pray. And, and sing and dance. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm bringing forth, that kind of spirit. Very good. And for our listeners to discover more, what is your website again, John? Um, it's uh, www, which it is for everyone. <laughs> and then it's, it's just my name, johnlockley.com. So it's just my name, John, so J-O-H-N, John, and Lockley, which is L-O-C-K-L-E-Y, johnlockley.com. And then they can look under the calendar section, and they will see my work in Portland and the Colorado area. Well, very good. John, thank you for bringing this wisdom here to our Western audience. I know that this is something that is desperately needed. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for being on the program today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. You, you have a good day. You too. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can learn more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter as well. You can also follow us on Twitter at Beyond 50 Radio and Facebook as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.